you. Um, so we're transitioning now to the, the live stream right now. So people are watching on HowlRound. Uh, So Rachel, when, if you want to talk, you have to talk. Oh, oh goody. But I'm a theater artist, I just project. Um, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Okay, wonderful. So yes, please. So we're going to do popcorn um, now. Usually I start with the introductions, because as you saw, um, what we, we enter this space each bring your individual thoughts, ideas, and obstacles. But then once we speak them into the space, there's an understanding that's felt by someone else in the room. Whether they had anticipated relating to that question or not, they connected with it. Um, the first year that Powell launched, our theme was motherhood breaking the silence. And we just spent the entire year sharing stories, gathering stories, and saying, what have you felt? What have you wondered? What have you experienced? The second year was on uh, initiatives and solutions, gathering those that existed and then creating those that did not. And now we're entering our third year, which is policy and protocol. We're like getting down in the dirt and really talking about change. Um, uh, but what we don't give up is this habit of everywhere we go collecting stories and collecting experiences. Because when we go back to it, that's really where the answer is in, in terms of creative solutions. It's in hearing what the need is from the people themselves. Um, so I, I'm going to touch on some of these questions uh, that were not asked in this space. Um, and what I want to do is, is address them. And if there's something that comes to mind for you that you would like to uh, add to the space, um, please just uh, pop up a hand and just shout it out loud um, so that we can keep at speed. But what I also want you to do is trust your impulses and trust your instincts for that. Theatrical, you can do it. Um, great. So uh, this one's really important and something that's not talked about in our medical community at all, and I thank someone for asking it, um, which is what kinds of challenges do LGBT plus parents face in artistic careers? Um, what they face in their artistic careers is expanded by what they face in society at large. Uh, what we find is an absolute lack in resources. Uh, one of the things that PAL is doing is partnering with Statira Arts, which is a national advocacy organization as well, um, in creating a resource page for um, transgender non-binary parents. So that includes lists of midwives who know how to work with their bodies, books on parenting, mm -hmm. um, and then organizations that are supportive of them. Uh, the other thing that we, we want to look at is uh, the fact that when it comes to EDI work, in the theater, what we're trying to do is educate institutions that parent inclusion and caregiver inclusion is included in that because the lack of resources and the socioeconomic burdens are expounded whenever you are um, part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so when you're talking about, well, we want to expand diversity if you don't have parent support as well, then an individual who comes to you who may be the right person for your institution, who may be a, an opportunity for you to engage in diversifying your work culture and creating work opportunity, if they do have caregiving responsibilities, you are effectively typing them out because you yourself are not an institution that provides it. And right now, there is virtually no conversation happening around it, which is why we're trying to create the resource page online so that we hope institutions engage in the conversation and they have a home base to find it. Um, some of the things that people experience outside are um, uh, obstacles in adopting children, if that's what they need, transgender bodies that become pregnant, who do not identify as women, breastfeeding in the workplace, um, and also work culture language. Uh, people do not know how to talk to each other in general, but especially when you are um, an individual in a transgender body, um, and you are engaging in parenting. Like we talked about earlier, parenting right now, the language surrounding it is on the binary. And so what we're trying to do is also educate people on how to speak in a way that dignifies and supports each person's identity as a parent and as a caregiver. Um, 
Then the next question is how can I be an, how can I as an educator be the best advocate for parent artists? That's interesting. So um, it's going to be two ways. One, let children in your classrooms. <laughs> Um, for parents, you will find that a lot of single parents are going to find that support particularly helpful. And then two, if you have students who are not yet parents, um, introduce the conversation at some point. I, I've spoken at a few universities, and I don't know how many people are like, oh, I just thought it was either or, or oh, I did not consider that. And the sooner we start considering it, the more empowered we feel when we face discrimination and shame to say, that's not right. Someone spoke to me when I was 18, and they told me that that's illegal to ask me that question in an interview. Even though I'm coming in for your director of development, you can't ask me about my kids. But, you know, so it's, it's about, as an educator, it's an incredible opportunity to plant the seed not only on the transparency of the needs of parents, but the rights of people who want to become parents, and the opportunity for those who don't become parents to be allies. Um, breastfeeding space in rehearsals. This is huge. There are laws that say you have to provide a breastfeeding space for an employee. Also, there is human decency that says you should provide space for a breastfeeding uh, employee. Um, I would encourage everyone, if you are not at the level of being a, a leader or a decision maker yet, to start to think, how could I support someone in this space who does have kids? And I would say, number one, embrace it, yeah? And then I would say, number two, say, is there anything that you need? But number three, simultaneously with that, treat them as an artist and a professional. So many parents are engaging with this internal war in themselves of, am I still an artist? Do I still, am I just a caregiver? How do I participate? And by you dignifying them and by acknowledging their artistry and their professionalism, what you're doing is you're empowering them in this space. It can be that simple. Um, breastfeeding space in rehearsal, I think that every individual should have a right to breastfeed in this space openly, and if you have a problem with it, that's why God gave you next. Uh, turn away. So uh, in terms of creating a private space, though, my recommendation would be make sure that that space is close to rehearsal so that they don't waste time. Don't make them use equity breaks to do so. Give them additional time. And also make sure it's not a closet or if that's all you have, get rid of the chemicals, get rid of the brooms. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from actual stories I've heard. Mm -hmm. um, make it a space that feels warm and welcoming and, and healthy and helpful. Try to think, if I had to sit here for 20 minutes with something precious, what would I want this room to be? Um, and then uh, let's talk about lack of empathy. So... I think that we can all empathize with this point, and it comes down to work culture. Many parents enter the space feeling already complicated, already a burden, already too much, already too many questions. But this is the idea of flexibility that was introduced earlier, um, and with, is this your theater company, PADF? PADF in Puerto Rico, who says it's just integrated into our work culture. It's part of who we are. And that's an example of an institution who is defining their work culture based off of the individuals inside it and not creating a mission statement outside of those individuals and try to place it on top of them. It's the difference between integration and oppression, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so this lack of empathy, I think that that is the source point for whenever we have a mission statement that's placed on top of people as opposed to a mission statement that is developed with the people who enter our spaces. Um, how can we grow our empathy for parents? I'm gonna offer a cheat sheet answer. Um, love, <laughs> <laughs> compassion, <laughs> um, but also the understanding that maybe what it has to do is how many of our own judgments on this other person come from potentially capitalistic expectations on ourselves of performing every space we enter. We have deadlines to meet. There are financial realities. This production has to rehearse on time. But how we treat people who are juggling life in a, in a maybe appearing in a more complicated fashion than we're used to does not have to be that clinical and so critical and so judgmental. So I say increase empathy by, by trusting that individual 
and trusting the contributions that they make by giving them value, not according to your own standard, but according to the standard of work and effort that they themselves are putting in. Um, yes, so what I would love to do is transition to the all people coming in. Hi, Hal Rounds. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Yep. Um, so we we uh, we need to move over. Oh. Right. We're we have. Okay. That was part okay, of the like, summation mm -hmm. to bring yeah. this this issue at close. Um, I want to thank all of you for sharing, and I and I hope that you find more valid spaces. And I want you to know that if you if you not finding or if you want oh if you cannot find those those spaces like here where you could contribute and find empathetic ears um, connect with us connect with each other and we will help you find them or make them so thank you <laughs>